All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Jared Barnes. I am an associate professor of horticulture here at SFA, and I steward and oversee the plantery, our student-run teaching gardens, micro farm, and grow houses. Today, I'm gonna to be answering the question, what is naturalistic planting? Naturalistic planting is planting with nature. Now, you may have heard this also described as design plant communities, or matrix planting, but I wanna make it clear that what we're talking about is not just wildflower gardens or pollinator gardens, or even letting a meadow or field grow up with native plants. Instead, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do plantings based on science, where we maximize the ecology. And when I say ecology, what I mean is the relationship between plants, animals, humans, and their environment. And then what we also try to do is we try to minimize the management because the last thing we want to be doing out here is coming out here constantly disturbing the soil, constantly replanting things, and constantly changing things up. Okay, We want to be able to install a planting and then the planting kind of take care of itself. Now, why would we ever even want to do this? Well, naturalistic planting began in Europe as cities desired beautiful plantings that were long-lasting, had low cost, were low maintenance, and were also beneficial to the environment, whether that was good for insects or mitigating environmental issues like, for example, stormwater runoff. Now that trend has now come to America. Uh, there have been naturalistic planting designs done like, for example, in Chicago at the Lurie Garden. Also the High Line in New York. The High Line has become one of New York's most visited sites and part of the reason why is because people love seeing this naturalistic style of planting in the middle of a city. There are other cities too, like Philadelphia and Houston and Denver, where you've seen models of this approach. And what we're trying to do here at SFA is try to figure out how do you do this in the Southeast? Now, some people come by and they're like, whoa, this looks different. But different is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, a lot of people argue that as we go forward in the future, a lot of landscapes are gonna start looking more and more like this. Why? Because we're mitigating drought, storm surge. We're trying to recharge wetlands and streams. Also, we've got to think about how do we use these plantings to house biodiversity? You know, we're struggling through an insect apocalypse right now. So we're trying to plant things that will help to provide for native insects, animals, wildlife, etc. And then also think about minimizing fossil fuels. You know, if we do this planting once, we're not here constantly tilling the soil bringing in new mulch or supplies using fossil fuels. Instead, we're doing targeted application. Now, like I said, this is planting based on science. So what science do we have to back this up? Well, for example, one paper that just came out uh, this past June showed that if you do this style of planting, you have a 200% increase in biodiversity over just manicured uh, pruned hedges and you cut back on your maintenance by one-fifth of the cost. I don't know about you, but I love the idea of saving money. Okay, now let's get into the nitty-gritty about how you actually do these plantings. Most plantings have four layers in them. The first layer we'll talk about is what we call a functional layer. It's the matrix, okay? And what the matrix does is it covers the ground for us. Its only purpose is really to act as a functional layer there to cover the ground. You know, think for a second when you've been out on walks. Where do you see bare soil out in nature? Where do you see plant, 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 and mulch surrounding that? We really don't see that. Instead, if we go out in nature and look, and we draw a one meter by one meter square, you'll see that there are dozens and dozens of different plants in there. And so what the matrix does is it mimics that. And what we do is we are covering the ground with plants because one of the rules of mother nature is, is that she hates bare soil. If you don't believe me, go out somewhere in your garden, disturb the soil, come back two weeks later, you're gonna see all kinds of weeds coming up in there. So what if we came in and put plants down there first so that they covered the soil and we didn't really have to deal with as much weed growth there. So that's the matrix layer. The other three layers we're going to talk about today are what we call design layers. Because while we want to talk about how functional and great this planting is for the environment, we can't forget the human element, that this planting has to connect with people and engage with them. So in this planting, we have also the layer called the primary or anchor plants layer, where what we have is we have plants like yucca and this vitex here that are going to be 
larger uh, plants growing throughout the season. They're going to have year-round interest. We're talking they're going to be prominent for at least three to six months so that they're really going to help to anchor this planting. Now again, this planting here is only about two years old. So the yuccas in here are just starting to get up to size. They should double in size before uh, you actually have their mature size reach. Now the next layer we'll talk about is what we call the seasonal filler layer. And a great example of seasonal filler is this black-eyed Susan that you see here behind me, and also those spikes of Leatris or Blazing Star in the background. These are both what we call seasonal fillers because what we want to do is we want to have five to six waves of color that appear throughout this planting during the growing season. So that even though we have the matrix and the anchor primary plants in here, we'll have eruptions of color, kind of like an ebb and a flow, almost like the tides of the ocean. And we have this color throughout the seasons, all the way from spring into fall, and even here we can get some color in the winter as well too. And another thing too I want to point out is, is that, you know, after these finish blooming, we'll leave the seed heads. That'll be nice architecture for the planting, as well as it'll be good forage for uh, wildlife like goldfinches and other birds. The last layer that I want to talk about is what we call the dynamic filler layer. And the way that I like to think and teach students about the dynamic filler layer is that it's basically a band-aid. Okay? And we've used in this dynamic filler this gonfrina here that has these little balls on it, what they do is they are planted so they'll pop up and erupt up out of this planting. And whenever the planting gets a little bit thicker, you may not see them as much and as often. But if something comes in here and disturbs, like a little squirrel or an armadillo that we have to deal with here in Texas, then hopefully those seeds are still there in that soil bank. So they'll germinate, cover the ground very quickly, and we won't have to do as much weeding in there because, again, we've got that dynamic filler. So those four layers really make up most naturalistic plantings. But then on top of that, our students came in and did a design with those four layers. So for example, the Leatris, the blazing star, sort of runs a river through this planting. And that's starting to bloom. You can see it has that purple coloration. The students chose both purple and yellow to maximize out here because we can talk about how they're complementary, contrasting colors. They help to create some dynamism. So off of that purple and the purple gonfrina, we've also got the yellowish color, creamy colored yucca. We've got the yellow black-eyed Susans here as well too. And then sure, we put in some other accent colors like white, uh, uh, yellow, other ones as well too. Um, then later on in the growing season, what's going to happen is, is that this aragrostis, this uh, the matrix layer is actually going to bloom, and this here is going to look like a haze. And you're going to have all these seed heads and stuff erupting up out of there, and so you're going to have a lot of texture in this planting because we don't just rely on color in plantings. We also like to have good texture so it looks good throughout the growing seasons. So the last thing I want to address today is, is that how can you do naturalistic plantings? How can you achieve this look in the southeast? Well, there's lots of great resources online and in books. You know, you can definitely email me if you have any questions. But what I would recommend to you is try to identify plants that will fit in one of those four layers for you. Because if you can start teasing plants out into those four layers, I think you're going to be able to put together a planting design that's going to fit for you. And the other thing, too, that I'd recommend you to do is to come see the plantry here at SFA. Come see the plantings that our students have done, because a lot of the plants that you see here were started from seed by students. And it's really incredible to see the talent of horticulture that we have here at SFA. So again, we're trying to practice and learn how to do this best in the southeast. And again, we'll hope that you'll come see us here at SFA. Until next time, keep growing.